webinar is now live. It's both my favorite and my least favorite message to get because it makes me anxious every time. That's fine. <laughs> hey, Mark, how are you? I'm good, Sarah. How are you? I'm We've got a really lovely day here today, which is in stark contrast to yesterday's gloominess. So I'm feeling a lot more cheerful and I've had several cups of coffee, which is extremely beneficial for that as well. Agreed. I'm on my third cup of coffee, which is not something I typically do. So hang it, with me. Oh, I might be speaking I, fast today. <laughs> I can confirm. It's fine. You'll keep up with my little Gemini self. So, you know, we're, we're all friends here. It's all good. <laughs> But we are so happy to be here again for another week of The Lunchroom. I am Sarah Schofield Manser. I am ART's Assistant Director of Special Events and Partnerships. I use the she series of pronouns. I am a light-skinned white woman with shoulder-length dark hair. And today I'm wearing a sort of flannel-ish shirt that I've probably worn on several lunchrooms in the past. If you're <laughs> watching the archival videos, please don't call me out on it. I'm also wearing headphones today. And I would like to first acknowledge that the Loeb Drama Center in Oberon are located on the unceded territory of the Massachusetts people, and that I myself am today calling in from the unceded territory of the Massachusetts, Pentucket, Wabanaki, and Penacook peoples. I would also like to say that ART is unequivocally opposed to hate and centers anti-racism as a core value. We expect everyone in the ART community, including our audiences, to uphold these values. And as such, we will not tolerate anti-Blackness or racism of any kind in our buildings, nor at our online events. We aim to create an environment that is uninhabitable to racism and discrimination, where all BIPOC staff, artists, volunteers, audience, and community members are seen, heard, valued, and provided the opportunity to thrive. This work is only possible when we do it together. So thank you for being our partner in it. A few uh, other Zoom housekeeping bits and bobs. You will notice that as usual, the chat is disabled. So you will not be able to communicate with our lovely panelists today using the chat feature. As usual, we will also be reserving the last 10 to 15 minutes of the hour for audience Q&A. So if you've got a question for our friends at any point, please feel free to submit using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. It is different from the chat feature. Q&A feature, please. The third and final but not least thing is that if you'd like to follow along with some subtitles, we do have the automated Zoom caption service enabled. So if you click the three dots more button at the bottom of your screen, you can show the subtitles or the live transcript. I'm not exactly sure how it shows up on our audience screens, but that's an option for you if you'd like to follow along at home. That was a long spiel. Mark, do you want to follow up with your, your own introduction? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Mark Lunsford here. I'm the artistic producer here at ART. I take uh, he, him pronouns. Um, I'm a white man with a, a brown beard, short brown hair, um, and I'm wearing sort of a, a blue gingham um, shirt, I yeah. guess. Is it, I don't actually know what gingham is. But that, feels, that feels gingham-y to me. Yeah. yeah. Great. Solid. Um, Exciting to be with you all again on a, uh, another week of The Lunchroom. Um, and we have a very um, sort of new and exciting conversation for you today, um, which I think, you know, as we continue to find all the great ways to use this platform um, to, to bring light to a lot of the work that we're doing at ART in a community, um, this is such a, a great opportunity. Um, and there's a lot to share. So I actually would like to kind of jump right in if we can. Um, and, you know, Creating Equal is a great highlight of all of the work that is done in the cultural sector and community as related to production, but not specifically tied to production. And I think it's really important to lift that up. And so we're really excited to do that today. Um, so with that, I'd love to invite Janice onto the screen with us. Hi. Hey, Janice. Hi. Janice. I'm so happy to be here. I'm Janice Maya. I use the they, them, theirs pronouns. And I'm uh, part of the steering committee. I'm one of the organizers for Creating Equal. And officially, Creating Equal is um, a group of 13 people, artists, organizers, facilitators. And we are developing plans to generate in the coming months public art making projects, arts based workshops, connectivity events, and original artworks in conversation with the themes of the 1776 production of ART. Um, and this is all in order to foster civic engagement in greater Boston. And uh, I'll speak more, we'll all speak more on our connection to it, but I did want to, Mark, you can play the little, it's just a small snippet of a video. We do these word clouds before every, uh, every meeting. And it's just an archive of like where the group is that week, like what has changed every week. So you'll see that in there and then the faces of everyone and um, a couple people who aren't here today as well. Right. Can we all see that? 
Are there any yeah. boxes interrupting our view? Are we good? Okay. All good. Oh my gosh, let's get those people on screen. Yes, so we love them. Yes, it's <laughs> us. So uh, we, you'll, that music was uh, by Still Gold. Mo Pope is one of our um, artists and he's wonderful. Karen, you can come back on. Um, yeah, I'm about to give it over to Karen, but yeah, that music is amazing. He's huge in the Boston area and unfortunately got a, or fortunately for him, got a gig and couldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. And there's also, you saw Erin Genia, who's also part of the steering committee and, um, Later on, I'll share a little more about her and uh, a photo. Oh, that's just beautiful. So Karen, take it away. And I'm going to leave you all here. We'll see you later for the Q&A portion. You. Enjoy. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, have fun, y'all. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Um, that was a fabulous introduction. My name is Karen Young, um, and I'm a cultural organizer and artist um, in the city. Uh, my main art is the Japanese taiko drum. Um, I uh, use it as a way to organize and to really talk about issues around power and identity. Um, and watching that video and being part of this project has been so uplifting. Um, if I were to really speak about what creating um, equal is to me, it's been a space to really be with other artists, to really think about what does it mean to really build uh, a community that respects history, that, that um, values and, and puts forward and prioritizes it prioritizes equality. Um, and so um, each of us are going to talk a little bit about what creating equal has meant to us, but also like what it is. And um, to do that, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my art. Um, I come here as a, a cultural organizer. I play taiko. I've been playing for almost 30 years in the greater Boston area. Um, but for me, um, this art form really lives in a space around telling a story. Um, my relatives started the third Taiko group in the United States, San Jose Taiko. Um, and they, uh, they were activists and organizers in the early 70s, really fighting for civil rights, but also established, establishing places for Asian American studies um, and were anti-war. And so for me, art and activi activism has been, always been interlinked. Um, and so what I feel I really bring to this project and what I'm excited about is to really question and kind of wrestle with our history. When I was first invited and um, I heard about creating equal and I saw 1776 and I saw ART and I thought Harvard, I thought, uh oh, is this really a space for me? Is this gonna be a place where we can actually question how we got where we are? Can we actually talk about and, and face our history on how this country began in terms of looking at issues around colonization and genocide and exploitation and all those things. And it has been that. Um, and I look forward to building, you know, spaces with my fellow artists here in the room, um, who I'm very excited to have you all hear from as well. But I wanted to share, for those of you who may not be familiar with Tycho drumming, I'm old school, so I'm showing you a photo. Um, this is a photo of me standing next to Molly Kitajima playing a big drum. Um, and Molly, when I first met Molly, was um, 82 years old, and she's playing um, with drumsticks almost over her head. I'm playing opposite her. She played until she was 88. She's Japanese-Canadian, um, but did a lot of work in the United States around um, reparations and acknowledging... Um, uh, the trauma around the Japanese American incarceration camps. So I bring her into the room as my ancestor, my elder, um, and uh, uh, a wise elder that I've learned learned from and continue to learn from. So that's a little bit about me. I look forward to hearing from my peers. Um, I'm going to introduce Micah, um, who is going to share as well. Yeah, thank you, Karen. And um, 
in receiving all of what you're sharing and offering to this space today, I feel particularly resonant with the idea of like, where is my space within this work? Um, and what does it mean for us to, to gather around um, these words or gather in acknowledgement, some recognition and accountability for the words in the Declaration of Independence? Um, and let me quickly jump back and say, my name is Micah and I use they, them pronouns. Oh. Ah, wonderful to know. I will take this earring out. I just found out they are hitting my microphone. Come on, adaptability. These are beautiful um, living plant earrings, actually. Um, so they'll, they'll stay on my desk and greet me as I talk, but not knock into my sound. All right. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, I'm a, I'm a words worker and um, an artist moving and creating in community. And uh, one of the ways I find words to be a source of empowerment for contemporary folks is how we can use language to reclaim ideas from histories we inherit and histories that have been imposed, potentially oppressed upon us. So when we first gathered for um, our first meeting of Creating Equal, I offered to share a poem that I want to share again today um, for all of you um, to hopefully give you a better idea of what I'm talking about. And I actually updated this poem uh, this past weekend. I had the honor to ground, lead some grounding and healing work for an action happening uh, through Dorchester, a march for Asian futures that happened uh, from a park down to the Chinatown gate on Saturday. It was youth led and centering folks who experience uh, gender oppression within the Asian community. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a fresh uh, new iteration of this poem that some of you have heard before. Dream seven in which Catholicism does not capture us. Sacraments happen every so often. Baptism like mama with mangatabo of rainwater for our desert mouths, stay hydrated. Confirmation is when I tell a precious them, I love you, and they say it back. Communion is this, and every this we have marched before. The actions and nouns and adjectives of here and now, our raw togetherness and our infinite possibilities. Reconciliation becomes our daily practice. We start at reparations and land back and go beyond the written words, faulty imagination. Apology grows into second nature. Accountability moves better, slower than clocks ever did. We spend more time in multiplicity than we ever have. Anointing of the sick happens free. Every sick person has the health care we need. When you die, it's not because of money. Matrimony exists for those who want it. Holy orders are given at every rally, every ball, on Instagram stories and across each other's stories. We find who needs love and how. We meet each other's tender hearts and teach them how to sing and cry and how sometimes the only difference between those verbs is the melodies of their wail. Thanks everyone, that's a little from me. <laughs> Thanks Micah, that was beautiful. One thing I've really loved about this space is the sharing that we've been doing. Um, and I appreciate you sharing your art right now. Um, I'd like to bring forward um, Irie, would you? introduce yourself and share a little bit. Yes. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Micah. That prayer is beautiful. I think I missed it the first time, so I'm glad I got it this time around. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Irie Roach. Um, I use she, her, her pronouns, and I am um, proud to be on this team with Creating Equal. Um, the way I came to this space uh, is also primarily as a writer, especially with that being something that I've distanced from, I think, in the last couple of years of um, of my life. And I think I'm returning and showing up to creating equal with um, remembering the glory of language, because I believe 
something that was happening was um, I was noticing a pattern of violence between my language and the language around me. Um, and that's something that I also hear uh, Karen and Micah talking about in sort of the reclamation of things that we are a part of and we do experience that just weren't used with words that could reach us. And so we are left out of this history. Um, so I return to creating equal with all of that and understand this as a space where um, we are continuing to translate beautifully. Re remember the beauty in translation and in reaching across um, as opposed to the violences of it. Um, and I'm just so happy that I grew up with the belief that we all have a boundless, formless capacity, which means you can reach and grasp, which means we can pull close and let go, which means the freestylers on 106 and Park on Friday afternoons were all the poet Robert Frost and Edgar Allan Poe could ever hope to be, even if those dead names were unfamiliar to the soon-to-be dead rappers. See, this is how I know you don't need to know light to be one. There is no need to study your own tongue. There is no degree that maps your mouth like your mother. Your best bet at graduation is out of her disappointment. I could ask the same task of those dead poets, though. I couldn't grasp them shit. I know some shorties that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with John Adams' pen. We sign words into will, too. Maybe with a grill, too. Should we be chill, too? Did you ever notice a wordless response? It's I feel you on the street outside of the door next to the TV with 106 in Park on it. 1776 is nothing but an intimidating number. Nobody on my block would ever count such a thing as a day, let alone a year. And we don't use words like subtract in school. When you want to make the equal sign in the middle of the number sentence true, you subtract. We take away. Same thing, different word. What is a language? But a thing we build to sketch the shit you know, I know you know, you know? Or a hope just might live outside of us. This is what they tell me now, and I am so glad. I grew up with the belief that we all have a boundless, formless capacity, which means we can reach and grasp, which means we can pull close and let go. Thank you all. Um, and I'll pass it back to you, Karen. Irie! Oof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One thing I've so appreciated about being part of this group is that there's such a diverse, um, everybody comes from all kinds of art making practices um, and, and cultural working pra practices. And it's just so lovely. To, to hear and feel and see oh, who we are. Um, Elizabeth, are you ready? Please come forward. Let me un unmute myself. <laughs> wow, that was so moving and um, beautiful. Thank you all. Um, this is just amazing. Um, so I was going to quickly share a PowerPoint because I'm a, more of a visual artist, I think. Um, I do a little bit of writing, but not nearly enough. Um, and so I'm just going to quickly screen share and figure this out super fast. Um, I am a, an enrolled member of the Aquina Wampanoag tribe, and I do a lot of different types of artwork, um, multimedia. I work with traditional shell from our territory, fibers like milkweed um, and Indian hemp. Um, I use natural dyes. Uh, let me just, just get this in slide mode. And um, part of the inspiration for my doing so, practicing essentially slow art in a lot of ways, is when you slow it down and when you recapture traditions and kind of develop a time frame that works for creating um, meaningful art, you can also develop sensitivity to the materials, figure out what's toxic, how to handle things, how to take care of yourself, how to be reciprocal and sustainable in your practices, have a relationship with your homelands and take care of the earth because the earth is always taking care of us. You know, every day when we wake up and we breathe, we're getting that air from the planet. We're getting um, life-sustaining water from the planet. We're having some, uh, depending on if you're vegan or not, um, maybe you're having some fish um, or meat or um, plants of some kind in your in your diet. Um, yeah, it's just, it's part of everything we do. We're very dependent. And I think as human beings, a big part of our growing up should probably be more so now that we're facing climate change thinking of ways to to give back a little bit, to be reciprocal, um, be mindful. I think it's always a good practice and there'll always be plenty to share. And I think 
that's the root maybe of re- reducing some of the conflicts that we see throughout the world right now is learning how to manage resources in a way that there's plenty for everybody. Cause I think there is. And also thinking about the next seven generations, as we say in native beliefs, managing things in such a way that we don't consider this ours, but we consider ourselves as stewards that are taking care of resources and growing them out. So the next seven generations do even better and have more bounty and more beauty and more happiness and more peace than we do. So um, yeah, anyway, that's what I try. Uh, It's a lot and I have to think about it every day to to pull it off. Um, My uh, work sometimes also has gone in the direction of mapping. Um, Mapping is, you know, it can happen at multiple levels and mapping can also be used to map experiences. It can be used to map cultural perspectives. Um, It can be used to map ideas about the earth and a living earth. Um, in Native society, we use this term Mother Earth for the Earth because we consider the planet a living entity, um, a mother that takes care of us all, no matter where we are every day. Um, and it's benevolent, um, that is, is gracious about doing so. Um, so we try to be thankful about that. I was asked by a museum to create a map because they had an old map with inaccurate native place names that had probably been drawn from a variety of sources, some of them good, some of them not so great. Some of them had foreign names for native places that look like they could be native words, but they had letters that don't exist in Wampanoag. We don't have L's, we don't have R's. So it was a you know pretty clear, when I looked at Tessel on the map, that's a Dutch name for an island um, off their coast. And this is a place that reminds them of that, but it's not our word for, for Nope, for Martha's Vineyard, which you see right under the bear's paw there. Um, I conceptualized the map. This this one doesn't have the place names drawn in. This is the beginning of of my design process. I wanted to design a map that conveyed the land as a living entity, a powerful entity, worthy of our respect and consideration. Um, And I also didn't want to cheat and have a bunch of like recognizable highway lines and like English place names that have been transplanted that don't necessarily have anything to do with the properties of the particular places. You know, there's um, place names that talk about fresh and salt water. There's place name, names that, that describe the shape of a river as an otter tail. Um, you know, there's there's all kinds of beautiful place of the Great Falls or place of the Little Falls, um, the Great River, um, you know, um, the beaver, uh, Sugarloaf Mountain um, out in Western Mass, the Pocomtuck Range. Um, These are all really important landmarks, but the the place names that have been brought don't necessarily um, resonate with the place itself. They probably resonate with the places they come from, um, but I think that's a a separate thing. So kind of peeling away layers, letting people see this place as native, um, letting people experience the sound of native place names. The, the Wampanoag language was essentially outlawed. You know, it wasn't really legal to speak most native tongues throughout the country. I mean, we've all experienced varying degrees of, of oppression. Um, and some of our folks did end up in boarding schools and things like that, but we were also dealing with the pre-boarding school, you know, puritanical, uh, <laughs> rough system of not tolerating so much as a pin on your blouse, identifying your your clan identity and things like that. Things that you would be proud of in Wampanoag um, territory, Wampanoag family and community and history that's meaningful, that, that have great antiquity and go back and will go forward forever. Um, and so I just wanted to create this to, to kind of make folks aware of that. Um, and then I have a couple more slides. Um, one is of a wampum belt, this is a very modest reproduction, actually, of a wampum belt that's quite large and quite grand. It's made of all shell beads, handmade shell beads. It's in the British Museum, and it's designed to wrap around the body as this beautiful and very stately shawl. Um, and it has three community symbols or three nation symbols on it. And pieces like this, oftentimes they um, express... Um, confederacies, the solidarity, support. And I made this one within the past few years. And I think it's at a time when I really see the need and the value for that. You know, when I really feel like common humanity has to be the the glue that holds us together, common respect, equality, an equal say, 
Um, and I like the term creating equal. Um, and so I was also intrigued when uh, there was an outreach to join in this project because I I feel like the two things that I've been really interested in and dedicated to the earth, centering nature, um, centering a native voice and a native perspective have been missing from many um, historical sort of presentations, history books, of course, signs in Massachusetts. <laughs> They're just terrible history signs. I don't know who wrote them, but wow, they just need to go. Um, and so I think, you know, I really like this very diverse, really respectful, extremely creative, um, wildly talented um, group of people working together to create in various ways and to share in various ways. This is a Mother Earth and Bear pendant that also, again, centers the earth in our connection. Um, and uh, not to be political at all, but I was super thrilled. This was actually... Um, made for the chair of the Mohegan tribe as a gift. Um, and he had an, uh, a meeting with President Obama and he was able to take it off and gift the president with it. And then he told me about it afterwards. And I was really thrilled because it was a really meaningful piece. You know, it's a piece, a design that I really, um, really am invested in believing in. And I thought it was really appropriate. So it was like a secret honor of mine. I don't, I doubt that the person, the president knew, you know, who made the pendant or anything, but, um, it's a special piece for me and it's now it's more special too. Um, and I think this is my last slide. This is a killer whale pendant. Um, you know, being in the Northeast, being on the ocean, whales, um, thank you, Micah, for mentioning whales, um, by the way. Um, whales are really, really important to us. Uh, they're huge. They're beautiful. They're ever-present. They're, they have these incredibly long lives and wisdom and knowledge about the earth and about the waters. And our people have a really strong respect for them. Um, and through kind of creating agreements with whales, we would hunt whales and harvest the beached whales as well. It's a little bit different from later industrial scale whaling, less destructive and a lot more respectful. And, um, you know, our traditional ways dictate that we use all parts of whatever we take from nature. Um, so our ways are a little bit different. Um, and we haven't done that in a long time um, because the populations wouldn't sustain it. But also, in, in all honesty, we don't have the body discipline. For that now you know we don't have all of that beautifully coordinated community time and effort and resources to to come together and and take care of the resources and share them um it's a lot it's actually a lot of work and it's very specialized knowledge um but i think it's important to remember those things and still talk about those things and um still value the creatures themselves i think it's an important relationship that continues to exist even if it's changed so I think that that's probably the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was beautiful. And I, for one, like political. <laughs> that's me personally. Um, and I appreciate you sharing, um, particularly the sort of thinking about the next seven generations. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Janice, our, one of our fabulous co-organizers, um, who will take us next. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Elizabeth, Irie, Micah. I feel such gratitude to be here. I am a co-organizer, but also and an artist and um, organizer. I wear many hats. I'm a theater maker, primarily uh, an actor, a graduate of the ART Institute, class of 2016. And I'm here for collaboration and co-liberation and just, again, feel such gratitude to be here. I am going to turn it over to uh, the other group of folks from steer the steering committee who are going to talk about creating equals connection to 1776. Take it over, Alessandra. Thank Hello, you. everybody. So wonderful to see the uh, rest of the team talking about the connections. Feel free to hop on video as well. Um, so as Janice mentioned, my name is Alessandra Pinares. You can also call me Drea. Uh, I am one of the co-organizers with the Creating Equal team. And like Karen mentioned when introducing the idea of Creating Equal, a big part of this project is reckoning with and recognizing the history of America and especially 
the con connections there to the ART's production of 1776 and the Declaration of Independence. And all of this was very appealing to me because I'm a former historical interpreter at the Boston Tea Party Museum. Uh, and I'm also a poet slash playwright slash historian uh, who has done research on how spoken word poets use their art to uplift the historical narratives of marginalized groups that haven't gotten the chance to be heard. So Creating Equal is very much something that connects with my thoughts about the histories that we learn and those that we don't really get the chance to. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And uh, to kick us off, speaking of poets, we have the wonderful Brisa Munoz to uh, in enlighten us and enliven us with a poem. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Brisa Areli Munoz. I'm a theater director, educator, and cultural worker. And I'm also the assistant director for ART's production of 1776. Um, it's such an honor to be here with all these incredible artists and organizers. Um, and I thought I might continue the incantation that Micah and Irie set into motion with their words. Um, my piece is called Collective Liberation. Um, it's an original work of mine, and uh, I felt like it resonated with both the themes of creating equal and the production of 1776. So here we go. Collective Liberation. I know you in the in-betweens. Between this world and the next, past lives manifest to our right and to our left, bookending the exhalation of our chest where legacy finds rest. I know you at the tips of your shoulders, waiting to transgress at the slightest of events if our purpose is left alone to attest to why societal disconnects were invariantly essential to our epidemiological development, never sought to assess why we always received less than were worth combined. This conditioning strewn effortlessly on the nightly charade of the election parade, can I sing you a serenade? The streets are burning. This country is never what we knew. It is much more sinister in truth. People are being eviscerated because of our own broken nation, riddled with corruption and institutionalized hatred that we collectively sanctioned with our silence and evasion. The only currency that shows mercy when you're broken unfed is the growl of our collective hunger, our thirst for rebirth. Meanwhile, we're cooing and sobbing, not realizing that there's blood at the source, and we're left to wonder what's there to do while we swim in this bleeding, imperialist blunder. We must persist. As we stand divided and invisible, broken links in the system, what is is dissension, what we are called into question, a replica of the oppression that has existed in its tension between power and disaffection since time was documented. And in all that we've known, so few have questioned, so much is unknown about the power of our collective liberation. We are where centuries begin, temples of the divine laying our heads in the valley of time, trying to surmise why the magnitude of the sun meant that our eyes were not allowed to rise in awe and surprise that such a powerful thing exists as our collective liberation. Meanwhile, our guides recognize without knowing and wisdom one cannot memorialize the circumstances of our truth. And without rituals of mourning, one cannot know to be true that there's a part of us missing that we never knew that resides within me and resides within you. We are decided and presided by them, me, and you. Healed by its nurturance and affection, the sun-kissed demise of our radiant eyes stare straight into each other's. Can I wiggle you to nod, swoon you into submission? with my effort-filled suggestions and luminescent visions of who we are to each other and what we can do to protect it, mourn each other's lessons, move forward, mind, body renewed. This is the work of the soul. We are meant to be presiding over all that was and all that ever will be in divine love and harmony. Thanks so much. Yeah. Brisa, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I really like the line, this country is never what we knew. We've been talking a lot about the idea of kind of like the mythology of American history, as it were. Uh, and I think that's something that we've we've all really started to un imp un oh, unpack. Excuse me. Uh, so uh, Imani, if you want to want to talk a little bit about your experience with, with that, I would love to hear it. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing, Brisa. That was Wonderful. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Imani. I use she, her pronouns. My physical description is I am a brown skinned woman with short uh, natural Afro hair. 
wearing an off-white collared shirt. Um, and I am part of the cast of 1776, the revival that will be happening TBD. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be performing as a standby, which means I'll be covering several roles in the show. I still don't know which ones yet, but that's okay. And um, yeah, I'm here to collaborate and co-liberate. I love that term. That's wonderful to me. Um, and also I feel called to show share a very short poem that I have here about how I am choosing to approach the work in Creating Equal and also in the show. Um, what would be left if I took it away? Would I be more open to play and maybe stay put in who I am? Walking into my truth, which is further from my youth than I'd like to be, but it's all still inside of me. It guides me to exploration, manifestation without hesitation. Yeah, I just felt um, called to share that small snippet. Um, I think something that... It, when it comes to the production that we're trying to focus on with our two weeks of Zoom rehearsals that we've had to get together is um, it comes back to a quote from Nita Simone that says, artist's duty is to reflect the times. And I, I fully resonate with that. And um, something that Tim said recently was that every generation rewrites history. And I fully agree with that as well. And Many of us have only been able to hear one version of history from one perspective. And usually that perspective is of an older cis hetero white man. And I'm glad and honored and proud to say that there's no one in the cast who identifies that way. So that's just a wonderful thing in itself. Even starting from that foundation of voices that have not been able to be heard is, is wonderful to me. Um, and I think the things that, we've been talking about is putting the all of these like historically known people on the ground like looking them in the eye and seeing them as people not on a pedestal but also not beneath us taking in the circumstances of you know the acts that they were involved in what they did what they said but also like putting them on the ground and being like okay who are these human beings and how can we tell this story from where we are and um, I think that's all I'll say for now. Thanks. Thanks, Imani. Uh, and excellent transition. Uh, Tim did indeed talk about how every generation write, talks about rewriting history. So uh, take us away, Tim. Thank you all. Thank you, Imani, for that. And Brisa, for your incantation and offering. And uh, Alessandra and, and Brenna and everybody else who's part of this amazing team. I'm Tim McCarthy. I take he, him, his. Uh, I'm a, a white man with um, um, brown hair, robustly built, and today I'm wearing a pink uh, Oxford shirt. And uh, I am, uh, I'm a writer and a teacher and an activist. Um, I'm also, um, as this group insists, uh, an artist, and I'm great to be part of this collective of artists, this team and community and family of artists. I'm also, the through line of all of this for me is I'm a historian. And that means, for me at least, as a historian, that I'm a mythbuster, a corrector of our miseducation, a catalyst for a kind of re-education or revision, and also someone who seeks the real truth, not just of the founding of the nation of the United States, but of the arc of our collective lived experiences over time. Um, those of you in the audience who are familiar with the ART probably know me more formally as a member of the Harvard faculty, as a member of the Board of Advisors for the American Repertory Theater, and as the host and director of the longstanding series, the ART of Human Rights, and also more recently of Resistance Mike at Oberon and also virtually. Um, I've had the incredible uh, uh, opportunity and fortune to work very closely from the very beginning of the ART's announcement of the revival of that 1969 Tony Award-winning Best Musical 1776 and to work closely with the programming team at the ART to launch the 1776 Salon Series. My colleague John Stauffer and I gave the inaugural lecture of that, which was on the politics and poetry 
poetics of the Declaration of Independence, uh, and then uh, even more deeply working with the cast and creative team of 1776, Brisa uh, and Imani uh, and others, to um, be in conversation and interrogation of the Declaration of Independence as a text of 1776, as a moment in time, a kind of revolutionary inflection point, but also a predicament, politically, morally, and in every other way. Um, we, we work together to, to wrestle with the Declaration and to make it our own and to, to merge and align a reinterpretation of the Declaration of Independence with this capacious casting full of these diverse peoples and lived experiences and histories uh, to reimagine what that musical could be. And when I think about 1776 as a musical and these people as the people who will bring it about, I think about this as a revival of a play itself, a kind of ancient text that is about revolution. And when I think about revolution, I think about it in two ways. I think about revolution as transformation, a break with history, bringing into a kind of new dispensation. But I also think about revolution as a circling back, a circling back to the kind of origin stories that we tell each other that are rooted in a particular version of history that is often also a kind of engine for myth-making. And when we think about a return to the moment of revolution, we have to reckon with the twin evils of the founding of the country, the theft of indigenous land, the settler colonial project that was also the national project, and then, of course, the hundreds of years of enslavement of African peoples, in addition to all of the other other exploitations and extractions and inequalities and unfreedoms that coincided with the emergence of a rhetorical project and an aspirational political project and a national project so rooted in discourses of equality and freedom and rights and dignity. And when I think about creating equal, the Second Continental Congress sent 13 colonies and their representatives to craft this Declaration of Independence. And Creating Equal is a collective of 13 souls coming together to reckon, to return to the moment of, rec of revolution, at the moment of revival of this musical, to reckon with the myths and the truths of our history, to bust the myths and to seek the truth so that we can bring into being a new reimagining rooted in the past and our shared but contested histories, rooted deeply in the present and what we can do in this moment of danger and perilous predicament, but also possibility, and then imagining and calling into being a future where our art can help usher all of that in, a new era where justice can be what love looks like in public, as my dear friend and colleague Cornel West insists on us to do. And so I think about the 13 of us and the universe bringing us together, very different from the representatives of those 13 colonies. And I think for the 21st century, what this could become, what creating equal could mean. And it's just a thrill to be part of this group. Oh, uh, my God, Tam, you're gonna be fine. <laughs> uh, Brenna, I know it's gonna be tough, but can you bring us home? Oh my gosh, this feels so rude. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much, Tim. I, I never know how to follow you. I never know how to follow you. And it, I, not, not to be overly focused on the specifics of language, but creating equal is also made up of 13 letters, if we look at it as well. So maybe 13 might be our lucky number. Let's just say that. Um, hi, y'all. I'm Brenna. I use she and they pronouns. Um, I'm the Education and Engagement Director at the ART. I'm also a dramaturg and educator by training and an auntie and fiber artist by experience. Um, really happy to be here supporting and being a part of the Creating Equal Collective. I think what I'm most interested in sharing is just a reflection of some of the things that have been shared already today. Um, we're often under pressure either as human beings in a capitalist society, folks who are artists, folks who work at nonprofits to be productive or to make something or, you know, skip steps to get to that final piece, whatever it might be. Um, and I honestly, if you had asked me two years ago, I've been in the ART community for about eight years. If you had asked me whether something like creating equal was possible, I probably would have said 
no. <laughs> um, even when we, you know, even when we got through the process of creating it um, this past year, I wasn't sure that it was going to be possible. And that's not a judgment on ART or on Harvard or anybody. It's about the systems that are in place that focus so much on that productivity and what can we make. Um, and I'm just so honored to be a part of a group where we can honor the people first and the relationships that we're building together first. Um, one of our community agreements is to just be. That's one that came up um, in our various conversations that we've had together, acknowledging that our existence and spending time together is enough. Uh, we will still make art together. We will still have public events. Um, but just the, the intense relief and being able to be present with each other has been really nourishing for me. Um, so I just want to thank everybody on this call, as well as uh, Aaron, uh, Micah, who had to jump off, and Mo, um, for being a part of this project. And I'm so excited to see where we can go together. Thank you so much, everybody. Janice. So. Yeah, wonderful. I just, I, this is spiritual. This is amazing. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. I want to invite everyone back on um, from the steering committee, including Mark Lunsford from the ART, um, who you saw earlier, to kick us off with a QA if anyone has any questions. You, you would think after um, months of joining the lunchroom, I would have my tech figured out, but <laughs> simply turning my video on proved very challenging right there. Um, thank you all so much. That was such an incredible, generous offering from, from each of you. Um, and it really, I think, has livened up a Tuesday afternoon for, for a lot of us. So I, I'm so grateful to be in this space with all of you. Um, so many of you that I don't know and I'm getting to meet and experience for the first time, so many of you that I do. Um, so this is really, really thrilling. I have a few questions um, coming this way, and I'm going to try to, um, just so folks watching understand, I, I sometimes try to Frankenstein some questions together so I can get at something that lots of people are asking in different ways. So if you don't hear the exact wording reflected, um, know that I'm, I'm trying to sort of thread a few needles here. Um, one of the, the things that uh, has come up quite a bit, um, I think especially because each of you have shared such different entry points into artistic work, right? And I'm also, also really excited because many of you described yourself as culture workers. I, I, I definitely remember hearing Brisa say that, but um, several folks sort of speaking in this way about cultural stewardship, I think, which is really interesting. And so um, a question I have, uh, anyone please jump in. Um, what's the role that you see sort of theater, but all forms of art making playing in social justice movements and social justice conversations um, in this particular time, um, but also how it's connected to, you know, a theatrical production like 1776. I kind of want to jump in, Mark, just because I ruminate on this question a whole bunch. Um, <clears throat> you know, I have a dream that that theaters really do become civic spaces in the ways that parks are civic spaces, in the ways that museums can be curated to be civic spaces, to be places where community can come together and gather. And one of the things that I hoped, that I had, had wished to see when uh, our global pandemic happened was the transformation of theater institutions to not only envision like how are we going to make our art now that we can't be live in person, right? And like, how are we going to shift over and start doing this hybridity of forms, right? With film and all that. Yes, that. But I was also wondering, like, when are, when are theaters going to start to like be spaces where food drives are possible or where people can be getting access to resources or where people can be coming together in a safe, distanced way to find ways to connect safely recognizing that we're so disconnected because of this global pandemic in, in, in ways that we've never been before. So that's the, that's the function that I hope continues to sort of like that theaters continue to see themselves as real vessels for community. And that it's not just about providing access to the few who can afford tickets, but really sort of extending our hand and opening up um, so that everyone gets to, to enjoy art making the way that we as practitioners get to on a daily basis. Um, I'd love to jump in as well. Thank you, Brisa. Um, and say that as well as giving voice and space to different perspectives, um, to marginalized people to help work our way away from and out of oppression. I think 
something that we did um, really well in our two weeks of Zoom rehearsal. And it's a scary thing to do, but was that we took the time to address the messy and most likely formerly untouched subjects of gender and pronouns and race and privilege, even within our own cast, because it exists everywhere. Everyone takes up some kind of facet. Um, so I think realizing that there needs to be space for people to um, address things that, that maybe have happened to them in the past that need to be changed for the way that we process in the future. Or, you know, when you're dealing with something like the Declaration of Independence, addressing the facts of the Declaration of Independence and how that affects different people of different race and different privilege and stuff like that. And it is messy and it is scary and it's probably uncomfortable. And it was, I, I, I know for myself, it was uncomfortable to have those conversations with different folks that I've never even met in person before. But I think um, hopefully, you know, we can start to implement that with the beginning of any rehearsal pro uh, process, um, regardless of where the theater is, whether it's, you know, something going to Broadway or it's a small community theater or, you know, X, Y, and Z. Thank you. Thank you both. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Um, there's a, there's a, I got a lot pouring in from a lot of different directions, so I can I'll throw another one out for us that I think will be really, really exciting. Um, it's sort of a simple question, but I feel like it can have um, some divergent answers, which will, will be great to see. Um, what made you say yes to creating equal? What about this collective and this program excited you and, and, and activated you um, in this group? I think for me, it was uh, such a perfect combination of some of the things that I've been working on. I didn't mention, but I'm also doing uh, kind of more civic engagement work. I'm one of the members of Boston Spark Council, which is all about encouraging civic engagement in uh, people aged about 20 to 35. Uh, and in that, as part of that group, I'm specifically working on some arts and civic engagement work because I think that part of civic engagement is meeting people where they're at. Uh, and the arts is such a wonderful space for activists and people who know how to speak truth to power. Uh, and so when I saw when I saw the uh, job description for the Creating Equal, I was just like, oh, that's that's exactly what I'm already doing. And the work that I've been wanting to do uh, is to, to create the space for people to uplift their stories and to, to find a place for them to be heard. So that's what called me in. I'll just have to say, I was, I've was i been really aching for places to really wrestle with the, how this country began, honestly. I think since sort of racial reckoning has really sort of emerged in the last years in, in a way that causes us to halt, um, I feel like this is an, an excellent opportunity to really look at things like how how did we get here and what can we do you know to correct things honestly and um this seemed like a, an opportunity to really be with other artists who are unpacking those same questions and figure out how to engage the public in a way that we could have those conversations and actually think about i mean is it crazy to think about rewriting our constitution i don't know i would like to think about that honestly let me just follow up quick. Uh, my my quick um, quip response is that this is way better than any faculty meeting I've been part of. So I'm I'm happy to to, to branch out <laughs> there. Uh, but more seriously and and deeply seriously, <clears throat> for me, I I wasn't sure I I belonged in this group of people because of the fact that I didn't really self identify as an artist per se. Even though this group has has convinced me that I am one. Um, but to be in the company of such remarkable artists, I mean, absolutely brilliant and prophetic artists of so many different media from so many, working from so many different perspectives, um, really felt to me like an opportunity to really stretch myself at a moment in my life where I'm deeply, deeply eager to do that. And then also to be able to do that with the principal orientation outward rather than inward, right? Inward to Harvard, inward to the ART, inward to like 
traditional kinds of ideas about art and to think about the public and the collective and the community in big ways to me was um, an invitation that couldn't be turned down. No, come on, go, go, go. Yeah, <laughs> I'll make it quick. No worries. Um, yeah, to so work with other artists who are like-minded individuals and um, is the dream always. And also, I'm pretty new to poetry. Like, I'm not new to acting and singing and dancing, but I'm new to poetry. So, if if I can be around other poets and encourage my work to be out, then that's great. And then also if we can create events where other people who might be scared to step into their poetry, like to, to be able to use their voices, like that's like a win, 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 like honestly. So that's why I'm here. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. I also just wanted what everyone is saying and um, thinking about the the transformation that happens when you engage your imagination, the transformative healing powers of expression, especially in a time where touch is limited or taken away. I'm thinking of people who are incarcerated or people who are on Zooms. Like it's all like we all have have been enduring this this level of um, of limited touch and the opportunity to create with other people who are centering the community and know that community care is self-care is uh, such a gift, especially to expand my idea of what um, community is and, and outreach and taking care of each other. So this is just a dream team. Thank you for that, Janice. I mean, a lot of this connects for me, I think, too, because especially um, when Micah had described themselves, I think as a words worker, is that, is that the phrase they used? Yeah, I was like, oh, I love, love that. And it, it, it sort of unlocked a lot of what everyone was sharing in, in so many different ways, right? The amazing poetry that so many of you have offered. I felt like it was immediately connecting me, Elizabeth, to your work and how all these things, that, that phrase really um, unlocked a lot for me in this conversation, which was, which was exciting. Um, and it sort of offers the perfect segue because in our, in our final moments here, I believe we had um, a, a sort of exercise or interactive moment we wanted to engage the audience in. So I'd love to hand off um, for, for this to sort of take us out. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, everyone. This has been so amazing to witness. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jesse Stiegel. I'm the documentation and evaluation dramaturg for Creating Equal. Um, you know, because we don't get to be in person every day, the limitations of virtual collaboration and making projects, uh, it's really important for this team to figure out creative ways to document our process, to look back and see what we've done, and also to be able to hand it off to uh, you know, future teams that might want to take these methods of working together and, and try them on their own. So as Janice had showed in the video that was so beautifully edited together at the beginning of our time today, we one of our prompts that we do every meeting is a word cloud. Um, and what this word cloud typically asks is, what has changed since we last met? Which is our way of gauging how all of the going-ons and the happenings since our last meeting has shifted our team and our thinking. And so today, we'd actually love to invite not only our collaborators, but all of the attendees to participate in a joint word cloud. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, looks right. Thumbs up if you guys can see that. Great. So this is a bit of a different question than we would typically ask our collaborators. Um, today, we invite you to answer the question in one or two words. Describe your experience in America. So how you can do this is you look up the very top of the screen. It gives you a web address, www.menti.com. And when you go to that web address, it will invite you to enter a code. And the code can be found there at the top of the screen. It's 66029356. It'd be great if maybe somebody could pop that in the chat. And as you contribute words, there they are. They will start to bloom and shift around. Uh, and this is our way of capturing our moment together. So we'll take just one to two minutes and invite everyone to contribute to the word.
one. And as you'll notice, some words are bigger than others. That means that those words have been um, submitted multiple times. So it's like hopeful, privileged, exhausting, shifting uh, is an experience that are shared by multiple people today. So I see that we're coming up on time. Feel free to continue contributing. This will not end here. It can keep growing even after the lunchroom stops. And I'm going to start some music for us to bow out. This is one of the ways that our group loves to celebrate joy together. And this is a song called Wild Style by Still Gold, uh, who's led by Mo Pope, one of the members of our steering committee who wasn't able to be here today, but is an incredible musician and artist in the Boston area. So if I share my screen... And if anybody, Mark, um, uh, Janice, Alsha, does any last words to say, I'll uh, shift it over to you now. I think we just want to say thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, feel free to join us in some dancing uh, as we get a little bit out of our Zoom bubble today. All about music and movement here. Yeah, and I, I also wanted to just say, uh, I wanted to share a photo of Erin Genia, who's not here. I asked, like, how she wanted us to introduce her, and she said, you can share this photo and say my name. So I'm going to share that real quick, and you can dance while you look at it, or, uh, yeah, or fill out the word cloud. Oh, I can't share. Well, someone else is sharing. I'll share it. Let's see. Oh, this is a great combination, this song and Aaron. Let's see. Oh, I also know. There we go. Can y'all see that or are there the squares? Yes, beautiful. And that's Aaron. Aaron is amazing. Thank y'all. Thanks everyone for joining us again. Thank you all for sharing today. What, a, what an incredible conversation. We're so looking forward to everything that continues to emerge in this collaboration, which is so exciting. Um, and thank you all for watching. We'll be back next week uh, with um, the company of This Is Who I Am, um, which is rebroadcasting uh, starting today. So come back to see what those folks have to share about their experience. Thank you all. <laughs>